All right, we warned you around here. It was interview season. We'd be back on the interview trail. We try to find some, uh, some, some, some former nights, some current nights, if we can, to bring on the show and and talk a little UCF. And we've got a guy who spent four years at UCF, was a part of a lot of big seasons, kind of a real interesting role. He's part of an interesting transition at UCF, and uh, and we're happy to have him join us tonight. It is uh, kicker Daniel Obarski is our guest this week. First off, Daniel, thanks so much for taking the time to join us on the show. Thank you both for inviting me. I'm glad I can make it on. I got to start here before we get into anything. Is it is it just Daniel? Is there a Dan option? Is there a Danny option? Or are you strictly Daniel? It's uh, whatever you prefer, really. It's mostly Daniel. Uh, most of the guys on the team call me Obar, but whatever you prefer, really. I'm good. I've yeah, I've only always heard you refer to as Daniel, so I was always curious if it if it was a Dan option. A Dan, like, do your parents call you Danny or anything like that? No, it was always Daniel. I think. Uh, I had one Canadian hockey coach that would call me Danny with his little accent. And okay. Yeah, he was about the only guy that called me Danny, really. I'm sorry, I have to follow up on this for a second. You're from Arizona. How did how did yeah. you get involved with uh, with hockey in Canada? So before Arizona, uh lived in Minnesota for five years. So picked okay. it up there, moved to Arizona when I was eight, played hockey my whole life. That was always the dream to go play hockey and I always wanted to play college sport and figured football was my best chance. So kind of followed it then, but played at high, um, travel hockey growing up and then all the way up through high school too. When, when did you decide that hockey wasn't going to work out? When did you, when did you, when did you say I got to hang up the skates and go full time for, for football? Um, this probably freshman year of high school. Um, that's when I started football. That was my first season tackle football, everything, but uh, to play college hockey, you have to be very, very good. And you have to probably leave high school, high school to go to a prep school, go to the junior leagues, all that stuff. And I kind of just wanted to go to college. So football was my best bet. What uh, what position were you in hockey? Were you a goalie? Were you a winger? What were you? I, I played defense. Okay. Yes, okay. Sir. Awesome. Well, let's let's start at Arizona. Obviously, you're a kid from Arizona. Uh, how how do and and when and why did you become aware of UCF? Obviously, all the way across the country for you. How did UCF become part of your life and an option for you as you were thinking about where you want to go to school? So it was pretty uh, – my recruiting story with UCF is actually pretty lame. Um, but I was committed to Purdue. That's where my dad went. He didn't play football there, but he studied there. And that was my dream. I was like, I'm going to Purdue. I'm going to go back to the Midwest, uh, all that jazz. was committed there for a while as a PWO. And then towards the end of it, I was like, I just don't want to pay for college. Um, so I was thinking about going to Air Force told some of my coaches, hey, I want to get my school paid for. Let me know if there's any other options. Um, the UCF coach called me on a Monday, said, hey, we like you. I said, okay, cool. Came down uh, to my school on the Tuesday. We chatted a little, little bit. I flew out to UCF on Wednesday and committed on Thursday, and that was about my whole my whole trip. How, how is being recruited as a specialist different than a, a position player? Obviously, we see all these kids with huddle videos and all this other stuff. What's the process or how is it different if you're a specialist, a kicker like you were? So the only main difference as a kicker is that not, not as many schools are looking, right? So every every year, I'd say about one-fourth of the Division One football teams are going to have a scholarship for a kicker or a punter. So because it is – very rare to have more than one kicker on scholarship at, at once. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's pretty much the same. You just have a smaller pool to pick from. How did you make the transition from uh, a defenseman in hockey to kicker in football? You said you found football as a freshman. Mm -hmm. did, did, were you just a natural at it? Did you play soccer growing up? How did you become a, a quote unquote kicker? So I played four sports in high school, uh, football and hockey, and then soccer and volleyball. And Freshman year of high school, I went to Hamilton High School, which is the biggest in Arizona. So I came from a very small junior high school. And I was like, I guess it'll be a fun way to meet people. Um, knew a guy that was on the team, went in there like two weeks into school, said, hey, I can kick. And they're like, cool, we don't have anybody doing it. So walked right out there, and from there it was game over. I tried my hand at receiver a little bit, but the two guys in front of me were both went Division One and were incredible athletes. And I scored one touchdown, and I was like, yeah, I think that's about it for me, and just stuck to kicking after that. You came here in 2019. Obviously, 2017, 2018, UCF going undefeated. How much of that played a part in you wanting to come to Orlando? 
Not much, <laughs> to be honest with you. I, I had very limited knowledge of what UCF was, really, if I'm being honest. I even had tickets to the Fiesta Bowl game in Arizona. This is a short drive for me, and I was like, yeah, Dad, I don't really want to go. I'm just going to go hang out with my friends tonight. Um, it's not a huge game. I'll just watch it on TV, I guess. Um, what the big thing for me was is that the coaching staff, and I think it carried over to, to the new coaching staff, um, is people were there for the right reasons. You know, it wasn't look at all this cool stuff we have. Do you want, do you want this? Do you want that? Look at the cool jerseys, equipment. It was, we're here because we want to be here and we want to win football games. And when I kind of learned that, that everyone was there for a good reason and that they just wanted to win games, it didn't matter about all the, the fancy or the social media or whatever. Um, I just wanted to come and win football games. So when you got here, we have a kicker on the roster already, and Dylan mm -hmm. Barnes, who really hadn't played much himself. Did you come in expecting that there was going to be an open competition, or did you think, you know, maybe this guy's already here, I'll sit behind him for a year? Is anything the coaches told you before you came in? You know, coming in, I I knew there was going to be a competition. I knew there was another kicker on the roster, and I gave him my all. In, in camp, we were going at it. I was lucky enough to start uh, kickoffs as a freshman, and I think that was – the best thing for me really because it gave me a little little taste of what are the what college football is all about helped me kind of get warmed up and truly get get a nice entrance into the game and dylan was just an amazing guy you know for him as a fifth year guy this is his shot to have a new kid come in um he could have kicked me to the curb really but after we kind of battled it out and the position positions were settled he was nothing but supportive and helpful and giving me tips. We watch film together every day. And even to this day, I still chat with him. And he's been very um, influential and positive throughout the years. That first game, I think, of your career, you kicked off 10 times against FAMU. Yeah. Is there any – I know – I mean, you get breaks, but as a kicker, you still got to run down there. Do you get tired? Do you get exhausted after a game like that? Um, every Most games, they're not, it's not too bad. But after – kickoffs are more straining – than field goals and after about seven or eight you start to get a little tired so with hypo and we were putting up 70 a game and i was having i think the most kickoffs i had in the game was 12 or 13 it, it got a little rough but it was all part of the experience and i would rather kick 12 than one then if you had any bugaboo your freshman year, there were a couple times those kickoffs floated a little bit out of bounds. Uh, obviously, I'm sure you heard about that from from fans, from coaches. What do you do about that? I mean, as a, as a quarterback, right, maybe you, you, you change your technique. As a running back, you do something different. As a kicker, do you go back and look at your technique? Do you go look, look back at your routine? How do you sort of troubleshoot when something doesn't go right? Right. Um, I don't know if do you guys play golf at all. Not well. But yeah. well, you, you can hit the same swing 10 times and one of them might hit the hosel and just spray straight into the woods. Um, and that's kind of what it is. You know, at the end of the day, your leg swing is going to is pretty natural and it's going to happen. Um, the only thing you can do as a kicker is put yourself in the same spot every time to make it repeatable. So a lot of those um, bad kicks that I had and stuff, it was more so my steps leading up to the ball, I was either pulling up short or going too deep. And I just wasn't putting my body in a place where that leg swing could be natural and uh, just let it happen. So a lot of this stuff isn't really in the game. It's kind of the day after and stuff, because it's in the get once you get in the game, you just got to let uh, your natural ability kind of take over at that point. Because I or personally, I know a lot of guys tend to hyper analyze and think really hard. I think it's just more of a natural flow and um, once you come to the game, it's kind of too late to make adjustments. Yeah, I was going to ask, what, what's the sideline like after after that? Do you, I mean, do you go to coaches and kind of talk about what's happening? Are they giving you kind of tips and pointers again? Because it's such a unique um, skill set that you have, right? Like, how how, do, how does a coach maybe help you in the moment in a game after something like that? You know, I've, I've definitely had my um, – I've definitely heard it a few times. Um, but for the most part, both with the old coaching staff and the new coaching staff, um, they all believed in me which I think is huge. And even if it didn't go as planned, you know, I'm coming to the sideline. Um, the rest of the specialists always have my back. We chat about it. Um, what happened? All right, let's fix it and forget about it. Okay. We acknowledge that that happened, but we got, we still got, we still have more kicks to go. So fix it, 
forget about it and on to the next one. Because at that point, I think everybody that's playing in the game has the right to be there and knows what to do. So really just being able to push it off and go on to the next one. I always assumed maybe you guys were trying to be strategic. You want to pin them inside the five on the left side or the right side. You're telling me you're, just, you're trying to hit those down the middle and they're going that way sometimes? Uh, no, not down the middle. Definitely to the left. And sometimes I'm just, I mean, kicking a football is truly, you can be half an inch off of where you want to be and that can absolutely fall your kick. So truly, we were, we were aiming left, yes, but a few of those were just poorly hit balls. I mean, you kicked off 99 times that year. Nobody talks about the 90 times you didn't kick it out of bounds. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> So, right. um, so th that 2020 year, COVID comes. It's a little bit of a weird season, right? right. Um, do you go back home in the off season in Arizona? Were you here in Florida with the team? How'd you handle it? So I actually I went home right because I guess we were on spring break, and I stayed home. I stayed home the whole time, and every week was training with a few fantastic kick kicking coaches. I don't know if you've heard of the Zendejas family. Um, yeah, kind of yeah. a legacy of kickers there. Um, Luis, who works for the Cardinals, he has a 60-yard football field in his backyard and let everybody come kick for free. And then his brother, Alex Sr. and Alex Jr., they own a gym called AZ Kicking, and I would go in there and work out two, three times a week. I can go kick with them and go kick with Luis, and those guys have really been instrumental to my kicking success. So when the season starts, was there an open competition again that year? What were the other kickers on the roster in 2020? I think it was it was me and then what, Riley Stevens, I believe. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was an open competition and just had to go into fall camp and battle and go with the best guy. I mean, that's kind of how it is every year. I think um, unlike some other positions on the team, you can't really have a bad day. I mean, some other – other positions, it's it's fighting every single day to earn your spot. Once you have kind of earn your spot, there's probably a little bit more leeway. But in kicking, at the end of the day, if you're not ready to go, you're not ready to go. And it, it stinks because it's one of the only positions where you're as only only as good as your stats are, really. Obviously, Mike said 2020 was a weird year, right? Uh, half half fill stadiums. Um, you know, UCF got off to a weird start. We had like four false starts against ECU in a row, which I'd never seen before, right? Just kind of a, a weird mojo year. And probably one of the games that that was the quote unquote weirdest of that season was the game at Memphis. It's high scoring mm -hmm. game, obviously, a lot of offense, very little defense being played that day. Obviously, they score late. We have a chance. We drive down uh, and we have the opportunity to set up for a field goal. Take us up until the field goal time. As a kicker on the sideline, when you know the team is driving, you know you may get pressed into duty. Are you doing anything different? Are you warming up at the net? Are you watching the uh, the play? Mm -hmm. Are you waiting here from coaches? Kind of what are you doing as you you know your team's setting up potentially for the opportunity for you to hit a game winning kick? So, what I will say about that game um, it was a huge turning point in my career. Right, um, I felt great. You know, was doing good in the warm ups at halftime. Felt good. I was like, I'm going to go nail this kick. Right, I was kicking in the net on the sideline, just mentally. You know, you got this. You got this. You got this. Um, and going out there, it's just, there's nothing like it. You can prepare all you want for it, but when you go out there and everybody's looking at you and you know, what's at stake, it's truly something I'll probably never experience again. It was just a wild feeling. Um, and the worst part about it was I actually hit a pretty good ball. It just wasn't straight, you know, and the worst part of, or my problem with that game is that I didn't prepare. Um, I was only prepared for the positive and I was not prepared for the negative, you know, and when things didn't go our way, it was just, you know, it, it all hits you real quick. And I didn't prepare um, mentally well enough to handle both the good and the bad that day. Obviously, the, the the flip side of that, the viral moment uh, of you, and obviously everyone's seen it now. Obviously, you and Quadri on the sideline, you guys getting into in some some conversation. When you look at that video now, what do you think as, as you see that video? And I don't know if you've seen it since. If you see it today, what do you think when you watch that video? Um, it, honestly, it's embarrassing. But at this point, I kind of just laugh at it. You know, look at me being an idiot on the sideline. I wish it wasn't nationally televised, but, um, you know, definitely not one of my proudest moments and wish I could have handled it a little bit better. But at the end of the day, you know, I have to live with that and I'm OK with it. You know, I wish things would have went differently. I wish I would have prepared better. I wish I would have made the kick, obviously. Um, 
and wish I would have handled myself a little bit better, but you, you got to learn to live with those things, I guess. Well, we've had a bunch of players on and, and they've talked about there's conflicts all the time, right? Guys have conversations. Mm -hmm. How quickly after that were you and Quadri able to kind of move forward and just kind of put it behind you? Um, I think uh, the next day, I think we, we both went into Hypo's office, had a little chat and kind of went on with our ways. But uh, for the most part, a lot of the guys on the team have their back. And, you know, it, it sucks that that's the way it ended. But a lot of guys were coming out to me, you know, hey, like just because so many people miss their assignment, it just it's miss their assignments uh, every single play. And it just happens that yours was at the big moment. So a lot of guys had my back and were really help, helped helped. Uh, Help me get back on track after that. Do you remember or can you tell us exactly what words were said? I mean, did he say something that really got under your skin or do you remember what you said to him in that moment? Uh, he said something under my skin or that got under my skin for sure. Um, I don't remember the exact words of it, but obviously in that moment, I just didn't take very kindly to it. I think uh, sometimes it's better just not say anything at all. Do you guys joke about it now? Is that, are you, is that okay? Uh, me and my buddies do. I haven't really talked to Quad much, but yeah. – yeah, sometimes me and my buddies joke around with it a little bit. All right, so obviously kickers have to have a short memory. If something like that happens, you have a game again the next week. How do you do that? How do you prepare yourself the next week coming off a thing like that? Um, I'll be honest, it was it was very tough. You know, that game, and especially the reaction from fans and everything, um, by the time we got back off the plane, I think I had 400 – comments and about a hundred direct messages on my Instagram and Twitter, just, uh, absolutely berating me. So it's tough. You know, people don't really talk about that a lot, but it's, it's not easy. And even that week going up to the game, I was like, what have I done? You know, my whole athletic career, uh, was leading up to that moment and I failed and I failed and being a kicker, you gotta get used to missing, you know, you have to be able to accept the failure and move on from it. And, just the coaching staff. I think I got extra kicks that week, uh, ramped it up, had the whole team around me, watching me kick, uh, yelling, screaming, putting pressure on me. And really just my family, especially my family, this other specialist, my coach in the room, um, everybody was just sharing love and like, dude, we know you can do it. You know, you have all the ability. You just got to move on. It was one, it was one bad kick and we can move on. And I believe we did. I forget who we played the next week, but it was a better game. Yeah, you you play you finish the season a lot stronger, but then the team goes and finishes the year in Boca against BYU in a game where I don't know how to describe it other than they just dominated us. Mm -hmm. And it looked like we were kind of just wanting the season to come to an end as a team. It was a weird year, you know, 2020. How many guys – you think guys just kind of wanted to get out of there and, and go home from there? Uh, just, not at all. Not at all. I don't think so. I, it was a long season. I'm glad we made it home for Christmas, but – I, what I remember from that game is just being banged up. There's a lot of guys on the team that were either not playing because they're injured or opted out. But I think at that point in the season, there was just a lot of beat up guys. And I think they were just more fresh than we were truly. Well, sometime early January, you, you get the news that Coach Heupel and the staff obviously would be leaving and moving on to, to Tennessee. So to kind of a two part. How did you hear that news? How does that news get to you as a player? And what was your immediate reaction when you – you found out that that hype and the staff would be taken off. So the unfortunate part about that is that we found out from ESPN. Um, <laughs> I remember walking out of my my dorm room and going, and everybody walked out at the same time, and we just go, "Did you guys see this? What the heck is going on?" And nobody really knew what was happening. And then we get a text shortly after that says, "Team meeting, ten minutes, be there." So kind of all showed up to the team meeting, and I don't know if you guys know Manny Messenger. Sure, yeah, and but. While we all loved Coach Heupel and we were sad to see him leave, um, I remember Manny came in the room and everybody was kind of down. He said, guys, at the end of the day, it's the players. It's it's the players that makes the team. And we kind of all rallied around that. I think Heupel leaving brought a lot of the players closer together. I loved Heupel. I thought he was a great coach. Sad to see him go. But I know from the aspect of the guys in the room, um, it all just brought us closer together. And we said, doesn't matter who's up front. We can, we can do this. Um, as a team of players, and then no matter who they choose next to lead us, uh, we'll still get it done. 
Well, obviously that next choice was, was Gus Malzahn. He's hired a, a few weeks after that. And obviously he was the big name, right? He was the name everyone was talking about. But you, you kind of mentioned this earlier. You spent a lot of time with your position coaches, right? So mm-hmm. as Gus started filling out his staff and he hires Coach Blackman to, uh, to sort of take tight ends and special teams, what do you do differently as you get a new coach? How does that kind of change your approach? How does that kind of change your thinking? And what is that like integration process like when you got to meet a new coach now and kind of get to know him and he's got to get to know you? You know, it's nice. I like, I like kind of like having the new coaches because it's a fresh perspective. You can take what you learn from the old staff and kind of move it to the new staff. And at that point, I believe I was a, I was a junior. Mm -hmm. He had Alex Ward was a a senior or fifth year at that point. I think Uh, Osteen was older too. He was a senior. And I think just the age that we had in the room were a lot more mature um, with a lot more mature guys we kind of met Blackman, you know, sat down with him, had a, had our chats about the current standing and everything like that. But at the end of the day, when you hit the practice field, it's game time. You got to go. Um, doesn't matter who's coaching. If you don't perform, you're not performing. Um, and we kind of find that out this year, too. So but at the end of the day, I love the new coaching staff. I think they're all great, great bunch of guys. They brought in a couple of new kickers that year, too. Uh, mm-hmm. Riker Casey, Bonio. When you see them every year bringing in a new kicker, how, does that make you, I mean, obviously you're a competitive guy, mm-hmm. but does that, you know, put doubt in your head or is that kind of just expected as college football? They're going to do that anyway. Um, a little bit of both, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, you know, why are they trying to replace me? What, what's going on? Um, you know, sometimes there's some questions, but like I said, at the end of the day, I have to perform, you know, just like everybody else on the team, you know, if you're not performing, you're not going to play. Um, and, I think having those guys come in, uh, they were both great guys. You know, we all get along to this day still. Um, But at at the end of the day, like I have to perform. And I think those guys come in, push me even a little bit harder um, because I knew nobody's spot was safe and I had to earn it once again. I don't think you even attempted a field goal the first couple games that season last year. But then we get to Navy and (laughs) we run a fake field goal right before Mm -hmm. halftime. It was like third and 13 or 14, whatever it was. You get the ball and you run with it. Just go through that whole play with us and tell us exactly what happened. So running out there, I didn't know we were faking it until I was about five yards onto the field. And I hear him yelling, like, it, it, we're running it, we're running it. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Just sprint out there. <laughs> and I look up at the play clock and there's five seconds left. And I'm telling Alan Kervin, the holder, I was like, let's go, let's go. Like, we're, we don't have time. And so I don't, I don't even remember taking my steps because I kind of just jumped back there so fast. I didn't get, a, get to look where anybody was at, but – we ran it and <laughs> obviously didn't go exceptionally well, but we got what twelve or thirteen yards and you got you got thirteen. Pretty, we yeah. needed fourteen, yeah. Yeah, um, but I purposely went out of bounds and touched my toe down on purpose so we could kick it. <laughs> um, but I remember being I was a little bit winded, and the Navy coach took all three of his timeouts, and I was like, "Thank you, man. I really appreciate that, <laughs> uh, letting me catch my breath a little bit." But uh, fun play. That's the only fake I ran. Um, obviously, wish I could have been in the end zone, but maybe if I was a little bit more of an athlete, I could have gotten in there. But um, I would got to. Glad I got to kick the field goal right after as well. How many times do you guys practice those fakes during the week? Is that every yeah, week? Every day. <laughs> every day. I mean, we – as like special teams, we have fakes I've written up every week. Um, sometimes they're the scheme of the other teams a little more uh, prone to running the fake than others, but we're running it every week just so we know that – in the chance that does get called, we, we know how to operate it. And even in that play, Alan Kirvin had a great toss and everything. Everything worked well until I had to be an athlete and outrun a guy. Do you have any fakes where you were supposed to throw the ball? I wish. I tried <laughs> to convince them and I never got to it. <laughs> As a kicker, do you want to run a fake? I mean, obviously you're there to kick, right? That's obviously yeah. your specialty. Do you want to run a fake? Are you excited when that call comes in? Or are you like, oh, come on, I want to kick this? No, it, it was fun. I, I, I'm definitely glad it happened. And like I said, it only comes around once every blue moon. Um, I don't think we ran any fakes this year unless I'm missing something. But um, I was glad it happened. I was looking forward to it. I was like, this is going to be exciting. I'm going to score a touchdown. Obviously, I didn't, but um, I'm definitely glad it happened. I don't know if we ran a fake this year. We, we we tried to draw somebody off sides on a 64 yarder. I don't know if you call that a fake. I'm not sure how you how you'd classify that in the playbook. Well, it was an accident. Is what okay. That was. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We'll call it an accident. It happens. 
Uh, obviously, after the Navy game, uh, you uh, you had a really big kick against ECU the next week. Mm -hmm. uh, puts us within three late. Obviously, Mikey Keene and Mark Anthony Richards are able to to finish that one off for the victory. And then the final game of the year against the Cows, uh, you have another big kick, which puts us up four, which forces them to have to go down and score a touchdown. Mm -hmm. Goal line stand, we win the game. Of those two kicks, do you have one that's your favorite? Which of those two kind of sticks out in your mind most? Um, definitely, I would say UC or against USF. Um, and the funny part about that game, I believe I missed one as well. Looking at the replay, that kick went in. If you watch the TV broadcast, it looked like it went in. And on the field, I was I was kind of stunned and they called it no good. And I went up to him and I was like, hey, what that was that not in? And he goes, well, technically, they extend the upright higher. And since the kick went over the top of the upright, even though it was on the inside portion of it, if it even goes above the uprights a little bit and hits that extension of the goalpost, we have to call it no good. And I said, but it was in. And he said, yeah, we probably could have let that one slide. And I was like, are you, are you kidding? You know, I, I thought it was in on the field, but I'm just glad I got to make the next one and we got out of there with the win. And the Gasparilla Bowl, you uh, you step up big again. Uh, you hit a bunch of kicks. Obviously, you hit one in the third quarter, which essentially puts UCF in the lead. We never look back. You have a, a field goal to ice the thing. We win 29-17. Um, were those the biggest kicks of your career? Thinking back on it now, were those two kicks particularly? And what was at stake, you know, playing a Florida team, right? Gasparilla Bowl game. Were those two of the bigger kicks of your career? I would absolutely say so. I think that UF game was the most electric, uh, fun, and proud moment I've had as a Knight. Um, that game was a blast and I was just glad I could go what three for four and barely missed a 50 yarder off to the right. But that game was an absolute blast. I'm, I'm glad we came out the way we did and I'm glad I could contribute the way I did. What, what was your range? If, if you know, before games, what, you know, uh, as you kind of time things out, what was your range? What's kind of the high end where you felt really comfortable if you got put into the game, you could, you could knock it down. In high school, I set the school record for a 54 yarder. Um, and I, I felt comfortable all the way up to like 58 because really um, just with leg strength and leg speed, it's kind of the same kick. It really is. So as long as the wind's not in our face or whatnot, I would tell the coach I'm good up to just about 60 yards uh, depending. But that's another thing that people don't really recognize is you come in and there is a trust factor with the head coach. Um, like Gus at um, Auburn had the Carlson brothers for eight years straight. And, you yeah. know, those guys are absolute studs. So there is a little bit of a trust factor there where even though I'm a junior, it's my first year with uh, Coach Malzahn. And after I have to earn the trust with Hypo, and now I have to kind of start over and get it with him. So I was glad I got to attempt that. Like I said, wish the results could have been a little bit better, but it, there's a little bit of a trust thing going on in there. So in to, going into this season, they bring in another kicker, Colton Boomer, mm -hmm. this time. Um, what was the battle like this season going into the spring? So going into the spring, you know, it's, it's, he's here to play. He's not here to, you know, just kind of cheer me on and say, it's all your job, but like, good job. Um, uh, and really spring was tough. I, did, I really didn't kick that much, um, about the back injury and tried my best. What did a, only, I think less than half of the practices barely got in for the spring game. And I remember my dad came out to watch me play and I was trying my hardest to kick. And after warmups, I was like, I, I can't go, you know, it, it's, there's no use putting me out there at this rate because I, my back was in such bad shape. I didn't kick a football all summer, um, was strictly rehab, tried my best, finally got in the spot to get back to, um, get ready for fall camp. I think I only kicked the week prior to fall camp. Um, so I went through it and just battled it out, you know, all this season, even through practices and stuff has been tough. Um, and I'm sure you guys will ask next about Boomer going in, but, you know, at the end of the day, I can say, you know, they didn't have my back or they were, they were rooting for him or whatever I want to say. But when the new guy comes in and doesn't miss a stinking kick, it's kind of hard to argue. Um, they obviously made the better decision for the team. And in, in the moment, it really, it hurt, you know, it, it kind of stinks to stare that in the face and say, Hey, it's not your game anymore. Um, but at the end of the day, I think they made the best position, best uh, decision for the team. Like even Riker went out and had a one heck of a season. Um, I, I don't think even then, like through fall camp, I didn't attempt one kickoff because I was uh, unable to, you know. So we get up to the – I don't think those decisions were made until the week of the game um, on who was starting. 
Um, it was a battle. Those guys, hats off to those guys, Riker and Boomer, because those guys absolutely deserved it. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned he didn't miss a kick. Just admit to us, I mean, nobody's listening to this anyway. It, part of you kind of root for him. Hey, can you miss at least one, miss something? And when he maybe misses that 63 yard, you're like, okay, I feel a little better. You know, at the beginning uh, through fall camp, it was a little bit like that. Like you're kind of sitting there like, I hope the best for the kid, but I also want to play, you know. Sure. And week three, I'm like, I, are you kidding me? I didn't find out till I think the day before the game that they're going to go with Boomer. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, what the heck? Um, I can say what I want, but honestly, when you get to the game, you just want the team to win. You know, it obviously I wish I was out there helping the team and making a bigger contribution. But when Boomer got out there, it's like I, I hope that nothing for the best of it. Or I'm always rooting for him. And even when he hit a ball weird or I think his first game he missed that PAT, I, he came on to sign that. He's like, dude, what's going on? I was like, relax. OK, you got excited. You picked your head up. That's it. Move on. You were smoking everything in the You kicked that amazing field goal. I think when you go two for two or three for three in his first game. Yeah. Um, something like that. But he absolutely deserved it. And they're both good guys. It wasn't like they're hang, holding over my head, like giving me a hard time. Um, both good guys. And I was just a pleasure pleasure to work with both of them. And even though I wasn't playing, I thought I was, the, I was one of the older guys there and had most experience. So it was just good to pass that along to Boomer and Riker as well. Obviously, kicking's got to be a lot about confidence. It's a very, probably very psychological. You're in your own head. Mm -hmm. you, you missed that kick in Louisville earlier in the year. When you step out on the field, do you feel it? Do you, are you have yourself – are you thinking about, it? man, I can't miss another one, or you kind of just – you have to find a way to block that out, I'm guessing, right? You know, it is tough, and even just like baseball, sometimes you can get into a slump and where you struck out last time and you're like, oh, I can't strike out again. And it, sometimes it does build, and that's the, the hardest part of the game. And no matter anything the fans say or anything anybody wants to tell you, um, I think I'm me and all kickers alike um, are probably tougher on ourselves than anybody else can be. So it, it's definitely all about confidence and um, being able to clear those things out. But at the end of the day, you just have to make your kicks and do what you can. And I don't think on the field I'm like, oh, my goodness, like I can't believe this happened or whatnot. I'm saying, you know, I got this. I know what I'm doing. I can, I'm fully capable of making this kick. You mentioned obviously, um, you know, coach was making a switch. Uh, how, how you said you learned to get the day before the game. How does that conversation take place as a kind of coach probably in the office and give you the news? How were you kind of informed or, or kind of let to know that that Colton will be taking the, the kicks at FAU? Mm -hmm. It's kind of, kind of just like that, just like you would, you would think it is in the movies, but um, kind of just pulled me aside and said, Hey, I think we're going to give Boomer a shot and see what he can do. That doesn't mean you're done. That doesn't mean we're not going to look back at you. I mean, the next three weeks in practice, I was still grinding. Like, I, I still deserve that spot. I still want to be that guy. And we were just going – I still – you know, every game of the week, it's it's prepare like you're going to play. You know, same thing with Mikey. He's not taking days off. You know, I'm not taking days off. I'm still working just in case some, some freak accident was to happen. I'd be ready to go in. As a teammate, Mike kind of touch on this, right? How – how, how are you sort of, uh, I know you want to help Colton Boomer at this point, right? You want to give him guidance, but to Mike's point, you also kind of want to play. How do you navigate that relationship, right? Uh, where you, you want to be there, you want to be a good teammate, you want to be a brother, mm -hmm. but there's still a part of you that's trying to figure out a way that you can get back on the field. You know, and I was lucky to have that kind of experience with uh, Barnes at the beginning sure. of my career, because obviously it's, it's hard to be best friends with somebody who just took my spot, you know, and it definitely hurt. And it's, it's like, I don't want to talk to you. Why would I want to talk to you? you just stole my job, you know. Um, and it took a little bit. You know, I'm still cheering them on, still trying to be positive. But I, I'd be lying if I, if I was saying I went in with a, my chin up, like, yeah, this is great. You know, it stinks, you know, getting your job taken. It does. Um, but just being able to, after a few games, you know, it's like, hey, this is the last season. This probably might be the last time I'm ever on a football field, you know. Uh, I just have to enjoy it and do everything I can. And at the end of the day, the team's winning. It's not the kicker one, you know. So being able to help Boomer, I think, and just be positive and give him tips and advice and things that I learned and how I approach things as well. Um, and he's he's been nothing but respectful. Um, you know, he doesn't have a big head on his shoulder or anything like that. And he's just a very humble guy. So it's, it's, it's easier to work with him. And it comes a time where it's not me against you. It's us for the team. And I think once we kind of both accepted that, then we were headed in the right direction.
We had some big wins this year. The game against Cincinnati at home, on the road against Tulane, and mm-hmm. Memphis was a big one. We looked like we were hot there for a while, right. and then Navy happens. Second year in a row, we lose to Navy. I know you guys couldn't have been overlooking them coming off last year. What exactly happened that day? It couldn't have just been the 11 a.m. start, right? Uh, no, it was not the 11 a.m. <laughs> start. And it really comes down to every single day, no matter who you are, you can win or lose the football game. And when you don't come out and play like uh, the championship team we could be, um, and that's exactly – you can get beat. And that's really exact, exactly what happened, kind of like uh, when App State beat Michigan and all these famous upsets, it's – you don't bring your game and you don't bring the game together as one team instead of 11 guys. Um, you can get beat by anybody. And the fans all season, we're having a debate, Mikey Keen, John Rice Plumley. You guys are there in practice every day. We hear different things coming out of the, the locker room, maybe from sources. These guys think this guy should be starting. These guys think this guy should be starting. How much talk was that in the locker room? Is there a lot of debate going on inside? Between the guys, you know, just, hey, I think maybe this guy should be the, the quarterback this week. Um, there's not as much as you would think. You know, both of those guys are extreme athletes, and they're amazing at what they do. And I think in in the locker room perspective, I think at the end of the day, um, the majority of the guys knew we could win no matter who was playing. And I think as well, it was kind of no matter who they put in, I'm going to do my job and take care of my assignment, and I'll let them do the rest. And once I don't, I really don't think it mattered um, who was in at what game or when they made switches, whatnot. Um, we both knew both those guys could take us where we wanted to go. Let's talk transfer portal NIL for a second. You're, you're kind of a unique position. You came in obviously in 2019 before all those rules were formally in place, right? I think there's always been rumors about stuff behind the scenes, right? Before formal rules were in play as you were on the team, obviously then you're on the team when the NIL comes into play, when the one-time transfer comes into play, how did you see things change just in your four years in college football and the sort of the year and a half you had pre NIL and the year and a half you've had post NIL? You know, it was a very unique experience. Um, And I like what they're doing. I think that a lot of kids bring so much to the university and so much to the fans that I think they deserve it. I think now some payments are a little bit outlandish, but I, I mean, I am glad to see that some kids are getting the money that they deserve. Truly. Is it a distraction? I mean, is, I, again, as fans, we have this, this, this whole thing that you guys are in the locker room with your calculators out, like figuring out how much money you're making that week and mm-hmm. on the phone with agents talking about, is it a distraction in the locker room? Is it something that people are talking about? Is it something you're hearing in whispers like, Hey, so-and-so maybe going here for such and such is, is it, is it as clandestine as we like to think it is? Uh, not really. You know, obviously everybody would love to get paid. And I think more, and I don't, I can't speak for other schools, but in our locker room, at least it's, you know, if some, we hear, Hey, this guy's getting paid or this not, or whatever it may be, it's good for him. You know, I'm glad he's here. I'm glad he's a part of our team. And I'm, I love what he has to offer for us. Um, the way, you know, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but at least at UCF, um, I think that they just – if guys are getting money, it's not I'm holding it over your shoulders, I make more money than you. Because I'm sure there was guys that weren't getting paid anything that were getting more play time than some of the other guys. And at the end of the day, like I said, it's it's not bragging rights. It's, okay, you're getting paid, so what? We're all here for the same goal. What about rumors from, like, other schools, from guys maybe saying, hey, you know, I heard I can get such and such from this place. Is there, are there, is there that kind of conversation that, that kind of permeates the locker room? Uh, that really doesn't happen as much as you might think after reading the news articles and everything. I don't think that happens as much really. Um, but in the case that it does, once again, I think guys are at UCF for a reason and I don't think it's for the fame or the glory. I think it's to win football games. You announced this week that you're entering the transfer portal yourself. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you're looking for in your next school? Do you want to move back closer to home in Arizona? Is there a certain uh, thing you want to study? What's going on? You know, first things first, I had I waited until now to put my name in because I wanted to finish my degree here and um, just be able to graduate with a degree. I'm not sure what the future holds for me. I still have to take care of a few things, but I'm still training. You know, I'm not real picky about where to go, but I'd love to go to a, a new program and just contribute to win some football games. 
there's nothing against UCF. I wish I would stay or I would, would have loved to stay before the season. If you would have asked me, I would have stayed another year and seen things out for a fifth year. But now with the way the state, things went this season, you know, it kind of passed the torch a little bit. Um, I have nothing against UCF. I really want to stay. It just so happens that that's not the, we're not in the same situation anymore. So looking forward to getting my degree and just kind of seeing what else is out there and seeing where I can contribute. What did you study while you were here? Uh, industrial engineering. Oh, nice. So yeah. when's the graduation? It's coming up soon? Yep. In May, May, beginning of May, I believe. So one semester to go, four classes left and three with a UCF stamp on it. You got a little senioritis yet? You getting antsy? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Earlier, Dan, you said that um, after that Memphis game, that that was kind of a turning point in your career. Why, why do you think that was a turning point in your career? What, do you, what, did, what was the, the other side of that, uh, that game for you? So, you know, it's one thing to have your own confidence, and it's one thing to have people have confidence in you. You know, and I think truly, if I make that kick, you know, I'm the best thing UCF's ever seen. Everybody loves me. Everything's good. Everybody has confidence in me. My confidence goes up. And then you miss the kick and you're the worst kid ever. No one loves you. Like it's, it's such a extreme higher, extreme low. It's tough when, you know, even against Florida, I go three for four and guys are still in my DMs saying, you know, you missed a kick, you stink. And, you know, you wish you, you have the good intentions of fans that, you know, they support their players. And it's not always true. You know, I think you see have this great fan base, but there's also those outliers that will let you hear it no matter what the occasion is. I mean, you could you could go four for four and they'll still text you about Memphis and say, hey, remember when, you know. Um, and while I'd like to say you just bounce back from that sort of thing, it, it's not as easy as it might look. And when constantly you're, you're walking around and people are like, oh, you remember that one game when you do that stupid thing and blah, blah, blah. It's not the most easy thing to get over. And I think just confidence wise and personally mental game and all that stuff, it, it, it takes a big chunk out of. Um, out of your confidence, you know, I think I make that kick. I'm on the top of the world. I have the confidence and I'm like, I know I can do it. Everybody loves you. It's guys patting you on the back every day when you walk through the hallways and whether you like it or not, it just, it makes a change. If you had to sum up your UCF career in three words, what three words would you use? You know, that's tough. Um, I don't know about three words, but I'll say it was an absolute joy. Um, truly the guys you get to meet, you know, I got to play with Gabe Davis and Dylan Gabriel, and I got to play with Alex Ward. I got to meet some amazing coaches. You know, it's obviously I would have liked to be, you know, set records, and, you know, come in and I was like, I can do this, you know, I'll set the records for this, that, and the other, and be the best ever here. And obviously things didn't go the way I wanted, um, which obviously hurts to say, but, at the end of the day, what a beautiful experience it was. You know, to beat Florida, to go to four bowl games in four years is not – not a lot of teams can say that. And to be able to just step on the field even once was a tru truly a blessing, and it was just a joy to meet such a wonderful fan base and attend such an amazing school. Was it fun? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there were some not fun parts about it, but at the end of the day, I wouldn't have changed it for a thing. All right, well, let's have some fun with you now. Obviously, we've uh, we've got some rapid fire questions, Daniel. I don't know if you're familiar with our show, but what we do is we end every show with some rapid fire. And there's some rapid, more random, I guess, music, movies, sports, comic books, video game. You never know what you're going to get here. So we've got a, a fresh batch of rapid fire questions for you. I'm going to start off first, okay? So if Daniel Obarski is going to the movies and I give you 25 bucks, What's your what's your snack situation? Are you going popcorn, drink? You going nachos? You going candy? Give me the snack lineup. Twenty five bucks at the movie theater. Extra large popcorn, uh, extra butter, extra salt, <laughs> which some people won't say. So you're watching your sodium. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, not at all. But yeah, popcorn is the absolute go to snack. And depending on the day, either a Sprite or an icy. So but no candy. You're, you're not way. no no candy. No sour not candy. Movies, all the popcorn. Okay. All right. I respect that. I'm a popcorn guy myself. I respect that. Twenty five bucks. You don't have enough to get any that's other candy true. at the movie theaters nowadays. That's it. You're getting popcorn and that's it. That's awesome. right. Um, all right. NFL playoffs are kicking off this weekend. Give me your Super Bowl prediction. Oh, uh, that's tough. 
I haven't watched as much as I would have liked to. Um, I like the Bills. I like watching Gabe go score touchdowns. Um, but Super Bowl prediction? I don't know. You got the Chiefs, right? I, I definitely don't, don't follow the NFL as closely as you might think. But um, who are the one seeds? It's the Bills or the Eagles. Eagles and I don't Chiefs, think yeah. the Eagles got it. Um, I don't I think like they that. have the depth. Or not depth, but shoot. I might have to go with the Bills. I think they're, they're getting closer and closer every year. I think this is definitely a year they can just put it all together. All right, when you play, I don't know if you play video games. When you play Madden, a lot of people pick their team based on the quarterback, based on the running back. Do you pick your team based on the kicker? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. And I will tell you right now, I am absolutely terrible at Madden. I can't read a coverage. I can't make an audible. I stink. But absolutely, I will take <laughs> for the kicker. Um, love playing with the Chiefs or sure. the Ravens. Um, so are you one of those guys where, you know, it's it's – Fourth and one, and you're like, yeah, let's kick it. Are you like third down? Let's kick it anyway. Are you always kicking the field goal, in Madden? No, no, I'll, I'll still go for it. I'll still go for it, but I definitely pay a little extra attention on the the PATs and the kickoffs just to make sure. All right, if I was gonna have a karaoke party and you had to go up there and sing a song, what are you singing? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, Touched by an angel. Wow. By what is his name? I don't even know. Is that Charlie Wilson? Maybe no. Fooled me. Yeah, I take your word for it. Give me one second. Yeah, by Charlie Wilson. Touched by an angel. Absolute great one. Can I give us a couple lines here? <laughs> Absolutely. <not. laughs> I didn't say it would be good, but I would try. All right, let's say, you know, you're having a, a bad day. Maybe you get a bad grade on one of your tests or flat tire in your car or something, and you have to call one of your teammates just to make you laugh. You just want to laugh. You just want to hear something funny. You get one phone call to make you laugh. Which teammate are you going to call? To laugh would probably be Tyler Paul, the most ridiculous it's a good choice. I've ever met. It's a good choice. His 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 Twitter handle is just, just drives me crazy with the threes and the fours, and it's all over the place. What would Tyler do to make you laugh, you think, if you called him? He would just say the weirdest stuff, that, like just he's most unpredictable kid I've ever met. And I hope he hears me down the hall right now. But uh, dude can make anybody laugh. All right, what's your favorite hangout spot around UCF? You guys just going to you know let loose for a night? Where are you going? Um, you know, there's a lot of good spots. I always love Bar Louie. Bar Louie's fantastic. Bar Louie and Hobbs are probably the best. I, I go there probably twice a month each, <laughs> but I love those places. All right. I'm not sure if this is going to be offensive, so I apologize in advance. Uh, in your career, you were number 98. Not exactly the the sexiest number from a football standpoint. Did you ever want to switch numbers? Was there any significance behind you wearing 98? I definitely did want to switch. <laughs> but, um, you know, in high school or in hockey, I always wore 87. So freshman year, I tried to get 87, got 88. Then sophomore year, I think I got 89. I was like, okay, uh, whatever. Uh, and then I actually got 87 finally on um, junior year. Then we go into senior year, got a new head coach. And the practice, the day that we had to stay late and pick out jerseys, um, I left practice early to make it to hockey practice. And I came back and he goes, Oh, uh, we have like 42, like 73 and 98. And I was like, well, 98 is kind of symmetrical, I guess. Went with that. Uh, coming into college, they asked me, give me your top three choices. And I think I said like 18, 19 and like 17 or something ridiculous. And I showed up first day, name on the locker, everything. Uh, you're number 98. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, and kind of was thinking about switching and then my family and all my relatives bought 98 jerseys. And I was like, I guess I just have to see it through. So. All right. We've had guys come on here before and do impressions of coaches. I don't know if you do anything. Do you do a, a good Gus Malzahn? Can you give us one of his pregame speeches or something? Well, I can, I'm, I'm terrible at the impressions, but I will say he does say some funny things. I love the boom. That's been iconic over the year. Um, I guess last two years, but I love the good old booms in the locker room and on the field and stuff. Those are fun. 
It sounds like he doesn't say the word darn. He says the word dern. In a press conference, I thought have sworn he said that you guys would play in a dern Walmart parking lot. Am I, am I mishearing that, or does he say dern more than darn? No, he does. He does. And I think it's that southern charm he's got. Um, but definitely has a little bit of that, and sometimes it's a little funny because things come out a little different. But he's, he's a good dude. I love him. I also, I noticed in that locker room stuff that that was you know UCF put up after the game, right? He'd get in there and he'd talk about the offense, the defense, right? Does does the booms, and for a while it was the D block was the nickname for the defense, right? And then I heard the offense; they were calling themselves the O show. Did you all have a specialist nickname? Or was there something for you all? I mean, like I heard D block, O show, and mm-hmm. I heard shouting back and forth. Were you Alex, Andrew, Mitch, like in the corner just yelling in a whisper? Like what was going on there? You know, as a freshman and sophomore. Um, with Barnes and the older guys, um, you know, how we had UCF fast or UC fast, UC fierce. I think, uh, yeah. we were always the un- unsung UC fly, um, but never really stuck and never really got around. But at the end of the day, we're just the specs and we loved it. I would have gone UC foot on that one. <laughs> would have been good too. <laughs> Start out there. The long snappers would have disagreed. <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, all right. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Um, I would say the ability to pause time because <laughs> no matter what, I think if you can pause time, then you can do pretty much every other superpower. Super speed, well, time's, time stopped. You can get there. Um, you want to fly? Well, time stopped. You can just get a plane or a helicopter or something and do it anyways. So I think that's got to be the go-to. Uh, he's thought of this before. Yeah, he's thought of this before. That's a good answer. All right, I'll get you out of here in this one, Daniel. Better dresser, Coach Heupel or Coach Malzahn? Depends. Does a, a vest and visor count as uh, well dressed? As much uh, as a shacket does, I guess. I don't. Yeah. I mean, it's all it's all relative, I guess, right? You know, I'm gonna have to go with Gus Malzahn there, though. Okay. Okay. Did you guys make fun of Heupel's shacket too, or is that just a fan thing? I think it's just a fan thing. I think at the end of the day, we got our jerseys on and we're not really looking. <laughs> That's fair enough. Dan, we appreciate you taking some time. Obviously, your honesty and, and a bunch of questions tonight and, and sharing a lot about your story with UCF. Uh, obviously, super excited for you to uh, move on to the, to the next step. And I know a bunch of people will be rooting for you. Congrats on the degree. Congrats on finishing a big part of your life. And uh, obviously, don't be a stranger around Night Nation. Uh, even though there may have been some people out there from time to time, even Mike or myself probably, who uh, who gave you a hard time. Uh, you're, uh, we, we, this thing now is once a night, always a night. But I think you, you qualify for once a night, always a night. Some people, I'm not sure if they qualify anymore, but I'll say right now, you qualify for once a night, always a night. Well, thank you guys so much for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. It's been an absolute pleasure to play for UCF, and it's been a pleasure to go to school here. So an absolute blessing in my life uh, just having met you guys and all the UCF fans and just just the opportunity to be a part of a, a lovely program and a winning program has been truly life-changing. So thank you all. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Go Knights. Go Knights. Charge on.